Okay, so uh, I gave this talk on Friday uh, in Cape Town. It was very nice. And uh, the, the feedback I got was there was too much text on it. So then on Tuesday morning, I tried to correct that before I sent it over. And uh, I actually added more text. So absolute apologies for the fact that there are no pictures. I've made absolutely zero effort. Um, in that regard, but I'll try and improve in terms of what it, but anyway, what's this about, right? So I, I should give credit. This is a uh, joint work in my team with a bunch of people who did interviews with people like you. This is going to be a kind of a weird presentation because I feel like it's every conversation I've had for the last day and a half on slides. So what we did was we, the background to the project is in, I should put on the next slide actually. So in, uh, uh, in, um, January 2020, or just before that, we pulled in two big grants. One is uh, the Participedia project. I don't know if anyone's aware of that. So I'm the research director for that project. And that's been funded by the Canadian government for a number of years. So we pulled in another 2.5 million Canadian dollars to keep building that network. And I won a big UKRI grant on rebuilding democracy, right? Enough self-praise now. But basically, I had all this money to spend. And then it was January 2020 when these when these started. So I remember I like expensed one ticket from Southampton to the Turing. And then I was just sitting on this money. I couldn't spend it because obviously stuff happened and we had to watch watch a blonde man telling us lies on television at five o'clock every day for, for, for a while. But in, in that time, right, um, one of the things you normally do when you win this money is you bring all your friends together and you, 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 you do, they're your advisory board and you spend like two days with them and it's nice. And I couldn't do that. I was really frustrated. So one of the people in my team, Stuart Middleton, who's really like the data geek of the team, as much as anyone, uh, said to me, well, why don't you do some like qualitative interviews with these people online and just ask them what's going on? And I said, like, if Stuart's asking me to do qualitative interviews, I should definitely do qualitative interviews. So I went ahead and did that. It was a really good idea. So what, what this is basically is, is we kind of found that at this time, right, COVID's happening. Um, I couldn't do my stakeholder meetings. So uh, we went and asked people questions, and we've done about 23, 24 of these interviews since um, throughout the team. And the kind of people, like, it's not meant to be representative or anything. I should caveat this because it's the first question. Got, like, there weren't enough people from low and middle income countries that we've interviewed yet, but we want to keep doing that. It is, if it's representative or anything, it's, so it's a spectrum of people that I'm talking about from uh, really national level NGOs, international NGOs, so from the World Bank, et cetera, right down to people in local um, uh, uh, government, working, doing public consultation, trying to cope with how do you do online and offline consultation? How do you use new tools like AI, etc.? So we wanted to kind of add to the case studies that we have. We didn't have this broad spectrum. I don't think, like, there aren't that many papers of what do people in civic tech industry think? Like, what do they actually care about, etc.? So we did, we did these inter interviews and we asked people the following. So look, what are your experience and thoughts of using digital technology and deliberation specifically? What types of problems have you encountered? Do you, what do you think about some of these new terms around algorithmic governance, argument mapping? So like Polis came up yesterday, a lot of these kind of tools. What are the benefits of these technologies? Really simple questions. What have you done to improve? Have you spoken with the participants? How did the pandemic affect the use of civic technologies? What would you abandon? What would you do differently? It's almost like doing market research on civic technologies. But it was super interesting what they said. So that's the preamble. I'm done with that. Now we're just going to do results for the next... 15 minutes or whatever's left, because that's the most interesting thing. So here's what people told us. Um, basically, if we wanted to summarize where people are at with this, we kind of think there's a typology of very constrained pessimists, we call them, and critical optimists. So the constrained pessimists are basically opposed to using technology and democratic participation. They believe it leader you know, fail or harm the process. And there's quite a lot of them when you talk to people from the participation industry it's quite prevalent, this attitude. Uh, big concern that they'll fail uh, to engage citizens, just for the concentrated power in the hands of small minorities, quite affluent, educated men. If you look at the research in political science on uh, on kind of in innovations or, or things that uh, are equal in terms of participation, what do you think is the number one innovation that gives equal participation in politics? Childcare is good, but I, mean, I wasn't thinking along those lines. Probably should add that to my, um, to my uh, survey. Uh, referendums. Referendums have equal participation between men and women. If you want to have, if you want, if you want to do like have white men talk over over women, 
do a do a do a mini public. Do you think the facilitation is there? But if you look at it right at the end of the day, you'll always find the result that uh, in 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 public meetings, uh, the majorities will 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 generally be the same. And there's some good papers from Switzerland where you can compare exactly the same people participating in these two institutions. Anyway. We did have a lot of other people that we, we would say are critical optimists, so I'd probably put myself in that camp. So we do see the possibilities for using technologies in, uh, in, in public deliberation, in, in participation, in politics and all, of all types. But it's a critical optimism because basically success uh, depends on effective design. And I'm going to come back to this again and again. There's not enough talk about how we actually design these spaces, online especially. We asked them why do they use deliberation tools. Some of this might seem obvious, but I still think it's it's interesting to see what people actually said when you pose them that question outright. Most people started off by talking about scalability. So can we lower the cost of participation, both for the organizations hosting the processes and for participants? Okay, so most people want to reduce their costs. That's what they want these tools for. So thinking from a market perspective, I think that's kind of interesting. Generally, most of the people we spoke to saw these as adding to existing channels and spaces for engagement or replacing them. So they didn't want online to replace. And I'll come to this in a little bit. But what I found really interesting, I did a few of the first interviews and then I passed them on to others in the team. And I found it really interesting that many people I talked to could not articulate why they wanted to do offline participation. They said, it's much better. And I said, tell me why. And I got fumbling and noise and not a lot of actual good articulation. So I'll try, some of them came to something, and I'll come to that in a minute. Another people, other thing people talked about is that, look, people's baseline is really low. I think we forget that. Most people don't participate in politics, and they don't want to, and it's probably fine. They, they, we should be thankful that these strange people called politicians want to spend their time doing politics all the time for us, and people like us. Uh, so they wanted to engage a broader range of people and increase the plurality of voices. They thought technology can do this. At least more responses um, from people who speak less often. So obviously, there might, it might it different type of people will use the access of different type of technologies, and we could get into an access discussion if you want. It's always interesting to talk about. Um, and kind of potentially triangulating this with different different ways of doing things to counteract the pathologies of political participation that we already see. When people talked about their concerns, everyone actually, oh, it's funny, enough, the, other, the other funny thing is there's probably people in this room that I might have a quote on the thing that I've never met. So uh, I hope it's actually accurate. And if it's not, we have an ethical problem. But hopefully you think I'm nice. I, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's accurate because I trust the people who said me this. Um, so one of the things people talked about a lot is, is their concern with the digital divide. This has been going, you know, this is the first thing you would learn if you did any kind of uh, course on communication. Uh, but obviously, it's off, off an intersection. A lot of people mentioned poverty and housing issues. So again, this is why I think if I went into other parts of the world, we would get similar things at a more extreme level. Uh, equipment for connection, lack of devices. One of the problems in, in, in Africa in partic particular, or at least parts of Western Africa that I know well, is the data plans aren't good enough. The devices are there, but you, you can't actually get the reliable um, uh, connections. And obviously, uh, if the light's being turned off every three or four day, for three or four days at a time, it's, it's difficult. So th there are issues with, with trying to run online on things, and especially working in a university, the classic issue of you go in with loads of tech, you spend six months of a project with people, and then you don't build any infrastructure to sustain that over time. And that's a typical thing that universities do that frustrates the hell out of people. Um, what's it representative of? That was a big question for people. You know, when, when we do this, do we actually think about representation when we go online? Are we just thinking about new shiny tools? Who's actually engaging? Uh, so you can see uh, Anthony saying there, all of the things you would soon have been values 10 years ago that you would get from technology, better access, broader reach, everything that we've built so far doesn't really achieve that, if we're honest with ourselves. That was his take. I'd probably go along with that. And this idea that actually the people who are marginalized get more mod marginalized by technology. So if you think about it, there's groups of people who are find it difficult to access spaces. And when you make you you add something new, you're actually adding a barrier and an inf inf infamiliarity with things that they can't they can't have uh, they can't access. Uh, this this was a really common theme. So. There is no guidance for people. So even though there's lots of people within this sector and within that kind of know these things intuitively, 
if you're a government, if you're working in government and you get told, okay, you're moving to the consultation department, go start running pubs, public consultations, or you're moving to the elec elections department, go start getting people to register to vote. There is no information on what tool to use whatsoever. So as Kelly said here, uh, it's knowing the tools that are out there and then you see governments procuring uh, tools and you go, why did you choose that one for this purpose? That is really strange. So uh, there was a lot of uh, talk along those lines and many people said, we wish there was an actual guidance for, for people out there, simple guidance on if you want to do, for example, uh, here it is, uh, if, if I want to do kind of mapping, if I want to do that kind of thing or representation of of, of, of conflict and consensus, then use POLIS. If you want to do long written answers to questions and you want large qualitative data, don't use POLIS because that's not what it does. It's something else. If you want to represent the whole argument map, use Mark Klein's deliberatorium. If you want to do, so, so that, that information is not there for people at the moment. If you want to just engage people in a, a momentary, momentary assessment, do something else. Uh, the other issue that we, we, we saw come up again and again in these interviews is that, um, uh, the classic issue of people just not just just ignoring uh, what what comes out of these consultations. So I think people spoke about this yesterday. It's the issue of you know we, we've done something, we've invested in it, and then nothing happens. So there's no accountability, there's no impact. Many people talked about the the lack of design, and this is going to come up again in the next slide. Um, design being you know not based on values and practical use. There's a, there's a really poor attitude among governors to doing user experience design. They don't really understand why you do it. Uh, even if they even if they employ people to do it, they're not employing them centrally in the cabinet office or something like that. They're employing them somewhere else. Well, there is policy to have in the cabinet office here, but you know, at the end of the day, there seems to be peripheral to everything that we do. Many people mentioned POLIS is good at good at supporting collective agenda setting, but not for in-depth discussions. And a lot of people mentioned that they would like to see more use of uh, things like momentary assessment. Does everyone know what momentary assessment is? So if you, when you're at the airport and you come out and there's like a green and a yellow and a red thing, it's like a momentary assessment in the moment, how you're feeling. So what we can use that for, for example, uh, if you're walking around town and you get a ding on your phone and you can go, are you happy? And you can go, yes. If everyone's doing that, you get a sense of the urban infrastructure. Is it happy? Are people happy in this space or are, are sad in that space? What, what's good about that is I think we often think about the complex process, so we want to do like really complex deliberation because we don't want misinformation or that. But the reality is most people just want to engage with government for a small time at one point. Most of them just want the services to be better. And we don't really think about designing services for that kind of problem, the main problem that governors, governors have. Uh, another theme that came out of this was kind of who is, who is seen and heard in these. Uh, I mentioned this already. It was fascinating to me when people try to talk about this phenomenological aspect uh, of in-person discussion missing when you engage online uh, compared to uh, in-person. So no one was able to articulate that well. Probably Lynn does the best job here. She says, look, there's too often a fetishization of tech. We'll use tech as an answer to the problem. It's exactly the hu messy humanist that is the whole reason this field exists. In other words, trying to understand people and un understand politics and get them involved. So I think that that Again, I, I found it interesting from a qualitative research perspective that people can't actually articulate what the issue is here too well. Um, many people talked about the, the lack of a physical pre presence having an impact on people online. Everything they do online feels regimented. Uh, Andy was here yesterday. I don't know if he's here today, but um, uh, you know, it's those little experiences. It, it's, a lot of people talked about eating and drinking with each other. And I think that's really important, right? So there's something that you get out of that. Uh, Matt Leininger said, like, why, why aren't we talking about next door as a participatory innovation? That's where people actually do stuff and make connections rather than polis or what, whatever it might be that we're using. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that a number of respondents said that the, uh, the design of on online spaces is often not welcoming. Anyone who's done like a, a citizen's assembly will know that one of the real skills of employing the people that do that is you go in a bit like we did here and there was someone really nice smiling at you when you got your lanyard and you felt good about coming to the place. When we go into online spaces, we don't get that, right? It's not the same. And, and I don't think people have thought about designing. So some people mentioned this and I thought it was really pertinent that people haven't thought about designing online spaces, just that entry, that onboarding isn't there. Also, with video conferencing, especially the abrupt transitions and the inability to look in people's eye and do the eye contact thing. Someone said to me, 
uh, you know, people could just be staring at you the whole time and you don't know. So <laughs> that's actually true. It's a bit weird. But I'm usually I'm usually staring at my own face, going like, uh, do I look really weird for like an hour in a meeting? But uh, that, yeah. So uh, those 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 human interactions, those kind of knowledge acknowledgements weren't there. So people are getting there in terms of. Uh, uh, in terms of you know how we do this, so the, obviously there's an advantage to international communication and, and communicating away from place, but obviously it's people's connection with place that makes them want to engage in politics. So there's that issue. Now here's the, here's the most interesting part. I'm getting towards the end. Um, the civic tech sector itself. There was a lot of comment on this sector, like what is it? And I guess people who are at this conference should probably see themselves either adjacent or in that sector. So. What many of the respondents said to us is that this is not a mature sector compared to other online application markets. Um, and they kind of said that in a self-critical way. Uh, Thiago, do you know Thiago? Thiago's fun, very fun guy. But he uses quite colorful language here. People who understand participation, understand shit about technology and vice versa. And what, he, what, what I think he has in mind is that um, uh, he doesn't have in mind the people in this room or himself, obviously. But I think when you go to most people and they they are doing consultation or participation, they are not. They don't know what user design is. They're not interested. They haven't really been through an experience of a design process. When you talk to people that that do the thing, they're not interested in. It was what Marcy was saying a while ago, right? If I I, I if I'm te I was teaching a public and min class master class two two weeks ago, and it's about like implementation failure. And you think like if you were going to you know. If someone came to you with some, most of this kind of civic tech, you'd be like, that is not going to work, dude. Like, there's no way. This is like, this is how government works, and it's a mess. So um, there isn't enough talking between between both. Uh, Eva said something sim similar to me. Um, you know, it's interesting that the civic tech people want to just apply the tools. And if you've ever read a computer science paper, it ends when the tool is built. There is no, there is no application. That's the end of the paper. Uh, the, the problem, on the other hand, is that, like there's a, there's so much trope theory goes on in the social sciences that you never get to the actual application itself, uh, and often it's very um, it's very uh, in terms of the uh, uh, people that want to do democratic innovation, they do they're in a they're in a competitive environment. They want to sell the innovation, and that that tends to be the, tends to be the problem that a lot of people put their put themselves on. I'm nearly there now, so. Um, Lack of consensus on what works, lots of jargon and marketing, but not the kind of quality of you'd have from a banking app, not the kind of accessibility that people would expect and have come to expect from the market apps that they use when they go and try and do political participation. So why aren't we getting there? So there's a real question about how can we as a community try and engage, we were talking with this over there a while ago, with the commercials so that there is some kind of a reward for investment, or maybe it's, maybe it's the funding agencies, but there isn't a funding model at the moment like, we're doing all political participation on, on Facebook and these places, not because we want to be there, but because there is a funding model to support that. There isn't a funding model to support the kind of apps that we want to, to use. And very much user testing not taken seriously. That was that came out all the time. So a need for permanent user research. Um, you're getting more sales pitches from than, than critical analysis, as Kelly put it there. Last, last point, uh, issues of underfunding in the sector. And it's kind of what I was just saying. A lot of people talked about one skilled official le leaves and then you're done. Basically, you're back to square one. For most of the um, the local governments we talked, it's a classic thing that happens in I Italy. So Stefano is a kind of an entrepreneur that's gone around Italy with his participatory budgeting apps. And uh, you know the issue is there. It's very much the participation is tied to the political party that's in power. So the new one comes in and then you start all over again. Uh, so that's a big issue. And I think Ali puts it really well here. It's 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 too expensive. It'll break. Somebody leaves. Nobody knows what to do next. Um, and that's that's the kind of time and again what we get from people that work in government. And they often get this issue where private companies will come in and sell them something cheap for a while, tie them into something that the citizens expect, and then ask them for lots of money afterwards and get them involved in long-term contracts. You know what public procurement is like, and and you never get out of it. There's no agility and in innovation. So. Uh, People don't want to give up control. There's all these other issues about it. A lot of people talked about, could we integrate this tool to lower barriers? So, you know, like a lot of the tools you want to use don't work with one another, and that's an issue. So maybe that's something that design could think about. Uh, I think most of the other things there I've already talked about um, uh, as, as issues that, that people came up with. The final, the final, this is the last slide. The final thing was about uh, where, when... Uh, worrying about going where people already are. So I thought that was like, as I said to you earlier, Matt said, like, why are we not working with Nextdoor? That's where people are actually doing their neighborhood participation online. 
uh, and yet we want to build shiny new things that are kind of open source, but they don't really work or they're not maintained or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it, it, just bringing that. There's people. There's still a worry about the dangers of technology because we're not really integrating with the mass market tools and thinking about you know how new how new innovations will affect the way that we do participation and not understanding what participation in politics is at the same time as we're designing the tools. So that's the summary, I think. Hopefully that was interesting.